some of the basic guides during salt analysis. You don't hold test tubes this way. You hold it at the upper part near the mouth so that you can observe the reaction taking place below. Holding it this way will cover your eye from observing what is happening inside the test tube. So it is advisable you hold this way. Then in drops, you are expected to check the color and nature of the precipitate, checking if it is white, green, or you are talking about gelatinous or powdery. Here is an illustration. We are adding now in drops. You see the precipitate for me. This is white powdery precipitate. This is not gelatinous. It's not sticky. It is powdery. Then in excess, you are checking if the precipitate formed will dissolve. As you can see, test to B and test to A dissolves on adding in excess. This one is test to B. The precipitate persists on adding the reagent in excess. So you see, in A, the precipitate disappeared. Then in B, the precipitate remained. You see it clear there. Hello. Please don't confuse test for ion 2 with ion 3, though both of them require nearly similar reagent, but be careful here in your observation. We need aqueous ammonia or aqueous sodium hydroxide and then potassium hexacyanoferrate 3. In with aqueous sodium hydroxide, a dirty green gelatinous precipitate is formed as you can see. The dirty green gelatinous precipitate will remain insoluble when we add excess of the aqueous sodium hydroxide. Then the Dirty green gelatinous precipitate will turn reddish brown on exposure to atmosphere due to the atmospheric oxidation of the ion 2 to ion 3 by the atmospheric oxygen. Please, we are now using aqueous. Uh, next thing is to use the aqueous uh, ammonia. We will observe similar results. Exact thing we observed in aqueous sodium dioxide is what we we'll still see in aqueous ammonia in drops. Dirty green gelatinous precipitate will be formed on exposure or on standing. As you can see, there is oxidation of the ion 2 to ion 3. The upper part of the test tube is reddish brown, and that should be the ion 3. Then the lower is ion 2, the upper part is the ion 3. So that is the third method. Now we use the ferricyanide, potassium ferricyanide, that is potassium hexacyanoferrate 3. 
Remember, in testing for ion 3, you use ferrite 2. In testing for ion 2, you use ferrite 3. You will have to get a deep blue known as tombu blue. Tombu blue. In terms of a, a, a test for ion 3, you get Prussian blue, but in ion 2, you get tombu blue. Though the blue are similar, as you can see, this is what we call tombu blue, not Prussian blue. But in analysis, they appear to be the same thing. That is using potassium hexacyanoferrate 3 and not 2. You use ferrate 3 while testing for ion 2. Now, please subscribe. As you can see, this is so colorful that we have used it to write subscribe. Subscribe for, to this channel for we have best for you in salt and qualitative analysis, even quantitative analysis. Watch three ways to test for ion 3 to know the differences between ion 3 and ion 2 compounds. Thank you. This is potassium hexacyanoferrate 2. While testing for ion 3 ion, you use ferrate 2. But while testing for ion 2 ion, you use ferrate 3. This one is potassium hexacyanoferrate 2. And here is potassium thiocyanate, it's colorless, but on adding it to any compound that contains ion 3, it forms a blood red coloration and hence it is called blood red test. Wow, you see that? Gives us a reddish color, you see that? So that's why we call it blood red. It is only for ion 3. Let's see the redness well. See that? Oh my god. In the test for zinc 2 ion, we need aqueous ammonia and aqueous sodium hydroxide. First, we will start with the dilute aqueous sodium hydroxide. 
you add the aqueous sodium dioxide to the first portion of the test sample in drops with the help of pasteur pipette as you can see a white gelatinous precipitate will be formed which will dissolve when you add excess of the sodium hydroxide to the precipitate you can see that the precipitate is gelatinous it is thick viscous and sticks to the wall of the test tube as shown clearly there on the screen unlike the one that is a uh, powdery now on adding excess sodium hydroxide the ppt which is zinc hydroxide we dissolve in excess sodium hydroxide this is because zinc hydroxide is amphoteric acting as an acid in the presence of uh, sodium hydroxide to form sodium tetrahydroxy zinc to a complex uh, salt you see the observation and the inference next step you now use aqueous ammonia in the same style as seen in sodium hydroxide the result is similar but our inference is different in our inference zinc 2 ion is confirmed because among aluminium lead and zinc it is only zinc that is a complex uh, that forms complex ion with aqueous ammonia because zinc is transition metal so it's only zinc that will dissolve in excess aqueous ammonia understood as you can see adding it excess adding excess ammonia will dissolve the precipitate and this confirms the presence of zinc 2 ion To clearly identify aluminium ion, we need sodium hydroxide, aqueous ammonia, and any of these three, conch HCl, potassium iodide, or hydrogen sulfide gas. First, we need to start with uh, sodium hydroxide aqueous, adding it in drops and then in excess. Then, in drops, a white gelatinous precipitate will be formed. As you can see, you add two or three drops. Then in excess, the precipitate is expected to dissolve. You see the precipitate is gelatinous, but not as gelatinous as that of zinc. Remember, that of uh, uh, lead 2 is powdery. Then, the next thing is to add this in excess. On adding it in excess, you see that the precipitate will dissolve clearly. Remember, aluminium, lead, or zinc will behave the same way with sodium hydroxide because they are all amphoteric. The precipitate formed here is aluminium hydroxide, then it dissolves in excess sodium hydroxide to form a complex ion or a complex salt. Then the next step is to add aqueous ammonia in the same style we have added aqueous sodium hydroxide. Here you have to be very careful portion to be very careful with your observation because in excess it tends to dissolve but it doesn't dissolve. Then on adding this aqueous ammonia in drops there will be a white gelatinous precipitate as we will also observe in zinc clearly there as you can see the precipitate forms but gradual clearly see that is a white gelatinous precipitate but hanging then on adding excess of aqueous ammonia this precipitate will not dissolve be very careful here we are adding now excess of aqueous ammonia if you are not careful you think it is dissolving no it is not dissolving this thing persists if it is zinc zinc will dissolve to form a very clear solution let us compare these precipitates now with that of uh, sodium hydroxide this is the one we obtain with ammonia and here now is with aqueous sodium hydroxide the clearer one is with sodium hydroxide that is it that is with sodium hydroxide then with aqueous ammonia you can see it is still not clear so which means aluminium do not dissolve in excess aqueous ammonia because it is not a transition metal remember lead 2 ion will not also dissolve so these two samples are showing lead 2 compound and aluminium compound which are all insoluble in excess aqueous ammonia this means that aluminium and lead 2 behave similar with sodium hydroxide and also with aqueous air ammonia so it is only zinc that dissolves but lead 2 and aluminium do not dissolve then to clearly distinguish aluminium from lead 2 ion what must we do we need these three reagents conch hydrochloric acid potassium iodide or hydrogen sulfide gas any of these can confirm this so let us see what happens now as you can see now with conch hcl lead 2 will form a white precipitate which will dissolve on heating but aluminium will not 
Then, with potassium iodide, a yellow precipitate will form with lead, but aluminium will not form it. Then, with hydrogen sulfide, a black precipitate of lead 2 sulfide will be formed, but aluminium will show no visible reaction. So, any compound that have succeeded in showing the reaction we saw with aqueous ammonia and sodium oxide and show no visible reaction with HCl, hydrogen sulfide, iodide is an aluminium ion. Then, showing you the differences between aluminium and lead. Yes, this is aluminium compound. There is no reaction. Then, this is lead 2 compound. What I'm holding is HCl. You see the white precipitate forming. So, with aluminium compound, there is no visible reaction with corn HCl. Then, this is potassium iodide, aqueous. On adding it to aluminium compound, there won't be any visible reaction. But on adding it, on any lead 2 compound there will be a yellow precipitate as you can see there the yellow precipitate is actually lead 2 iodide now take note it doesn't mean that anything that shows no reaction as you can see there is an aluminium compound no now in confirming the presence of calcium ion we need actually flame test calcium gives orange red to flame test which appears very green when viewed through a blue glass. So you watch this video here in this channel to understand more about flame test of calcium. Here we are going to use sodium hydroxide first to detect the presence of a calcium ion. First you add aqueous sodium hydroxide dilute of course to the unknown sample. The formation of a white powdery precipitate which persists in excess of the sodium hydroxide brings calcium ion into suspect. Remember aluminium lead and zinc will dissolve in excess sodium hydroxide. So persisting white precipitate shows calcium ion. Then calcium ion also shows slight turbidity. Be careful here you see the turbidity is very small. The, the, the precipitate is not too clear. So it shows slight turbidity with aqueous ammonia and in excess it remains insoluble but calcium ion is best detected using flame tests so watch the video on flame tests Big thanks for watching. Please subscribe and share. Sir Majesty Easy World Science channel is good for you.